What is going on everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program tutorial, part 2 of my science mode playthrough. In this episode we're going to be tackling the mum. So hopefully by this point you've been playing along with me and you've just done Minmus. Now it's time to tackle the slightly more desirable location of the mum itself. So that's what we're going to be doing in this episode. Here we are in the vehicle assembly building constructing our rocket. Now as for our lander, I'm going to try and avoid using any DLC parts to make this video as accessible as possible. And so for that reason we're going to use the standard Mark 1 cockpit. Be sure to right click it and drain it of all its monopropellant to maximise your delta V. And then we're going to attach a heat shield to the underside of it. After that we're going to add a decoupler, the Science Junior, Mystery Goo, Barometer, Seismometer and Thermometer Science Modules. And then once we've attached those we've got the main core of our ship. Now we need to just provide the fuel and power necessary to get it to and from the MUN. So we're going to add this fuel tank here uh, as well as a terrier engine just because the terrier is very efficient and we have to make extra sure that we've got some means of recharging the batteries on this thing so i'm adding two batteries so we have ample power as well as four solar panels to make sure that we're never without power we're also going to add some landing legs at the moment i've only got the very small ones but they'll do for the mun and we have our lander done so this thing actually packs enough fuel to circularize at the mun land on the mun ascend from the mun and then return us to kerbin now we just need to build a rocket to get us to the MUN itself. So, uh, just another stage below the lander of the same fuel tank with the same engine, the Terrier. And then I'm going to add two of the bigger fuel tanks with a swivel engine underneath. It's important you select the swivel, not the Reliant. We're going to add the Reliant in just a second. We're going to add some side boosters here, comprised of the same fuel tank as before, attached radially with the radial decouplers. And then the engines on these two boosters will be the Reliant engines. Next, we're going to anchor them in place using the struts. And then we're going to take the fuel line piece, click on one of the side boosters, and then click again on the central core to connect the two parts together. What the fuel line does is it makes sure that fuel is drained from the side tanks first, and then from the central core. So what will happen when in flight, if we fire all three engines at once, the side tanks will supply the fuel for all three and leave the central core completely full. Once the side boosters are empty, those engines will cut out, and then we can detach them. You can do this without fuel lines just by using the fuel priority shifter, but to make things easier we're going to just use the fuel line pieces. Finally we're going to change the staging so all three engines fire at once and it's going to be the same stage in which the launch clamps deploy as well. The last stage of construction is to choose our Kerbal. We want to choose Bob Kerman because he's a scientist and can therefore use the Science Junior and Mystery Goo units more than once. But here we are on the launch pad, hit Z to max out your throttle and press T to turn on your SAS and then when ready, hit space to launch. Now we're just going to go straight up at full throttle until our speed reads about 30 meters per second and then we're going to drop down to just below 3 quarter full thrust. At this point we're going to start very gently tipping the rocket over, making sure that you don't stray too far from your prograde marker on the nav ball aiming to be pointing around 45 degrees by the time we hit 10 kilometers above the surface but making sure that your flight is gradual you know you don't want to do any sudden jerks or turns in the rocket because that will cause it to become too unstable aerodynamically and you'll just flip over luckily at this point we have a lot of thrust to keep things nice and pointed straight i've also added those fins at the bottom there to help maintain uh, a good course now when I was talking about earlier about needing the central core to be a swivel engine, the reason for this, as you may be able to tell, the swivel engine has thrust vectoring, which means it can change the direction its nozzle points to give you that little bit of extra control. The Reliant engines are lighter and slightly more powerful, but the trade-off for those is that they don't. So they make great side boosters, but for the main booster, probably a little bit better to use the swivel engine. But as you can see, we are now passing the 10 kilometer mark and we're pretty much pointing 45 degrees, which is good. The next thing we're going to watch is the fuel gauges for those side tanks on the left hand panel. Uh, and then when they've run out of fuel, we can hit space to ditch them. And there they go, a beautiful detachment. And as you can see, because we used those fuel lines, it means that our rocket is still fully fueled. Next thing we're going to do is open up the map screen and right click on our apoapsis marker and just keep an eye on the time to apoapsis. Once that gets to about between 50 seconds to a minute, we can start more closely following our prograde marker, but we still want to continue holding 45-ish degrees for now. So we're now about 52 seconds away from apoapsis, we can start following our prograde marker. By following the prograde marker, we'll be making sure we're maximally aerodynamic as we pass through the upper parts of the atmosphere, and we can just use the rest of the fuel left in this stage to get our apoapsis nice and high above the surface of Kerbin, and giving us enough time to plan our circularization burn with the next stage. 
I'm keeping an eye on the map screen here, watching our apoapsis and waiting for it to reach 100 kilometers above the surface. After that, we've pretty much expended all of our fuel at this stage. We can go ahead and detach the lower booster and get ready to fire our third stage. First things first, we're going to make a maneuver node at Apoapsis by just playing around with the prograde and retrograde marker. You want to try and get the point at which the two nodes are starting to swap. That means you're going to get a circular orbit. And then we're just going to coast our way up there and get ready to execute it. As mentioned in the last episode, in order to ensure that you are being maximally efficient at your maneuver nodes, start burning when the time to the maneuver node is half the overall estimated burn time. So if it's a 10 second burn, you want to start burning five seconds before you reach the node. But that time has passed. We are in a circular orbit. So we can go ahead and uh, do a quick save by pressing F5 just to ensure that, you know, should any unexpected mishaps occur, we can just revert back here. So we're going to open the map screen again, click on the mun, press set as target. Then we're going to make a maneuver node and drag out the prograde marker until your apoapsis point is about the same height as the mun. Then we're going to grab the center of the maneuver node and just keep dragging it around our orbit until we get a mun encounter. And then we're going to focus on the mun to make it a little bit easier to get the last bit of it done. Carry on dragging it around until your periapsis is fairly close to the mun's surface. I went for 41 here as a nice safe height. Don't worry about getting yourself into like a equatorial orbit or anything like that. It really doesn't matter what angle our orbit will be when we circularize at the mun just because we're not doing any moon orbit rendezvous or anything like that after we performed our landing. So for the purposes of this tutorial where you're just trying to learn the basics, I wouldn't worry about uh, the inclination of your orbit. So our estimated burn time is about 80 seconds, so it'll be good to start our burn around 40 seconds before we reach our maneuver node. And then we're just going to burn until we get our MUN encounter. And this is going to pretty much drain this stage of all of its fuel. So we'll be using the upper stage, the final engine stage in fact, for the rest of this flight. Opening the map screen, we're getting pretty close, we're just going to keep a really close eye on it. Um, we're going to maybe throttle down a little bit just so we can get nice and accurate and get our periapsis exactly where we want it. Now actually here what I'm going to do is make it so we're actually on a collision course with the MUN. That way when we detach the lower stage it's going to crash harmlessly into the surface of the MUN and not leave any debris in orbit. After that we can do a quick burn in the opposite direction to our initial maneuver node just to ensure that the lander will not be crashing into the MUN surface as well. But that's all done so we can just initiate some time warp to get our way up to the MUN and then we can get ready to perform our maneuver node that will circularize us. Now do bear in mind that because Bob is a scientist, once he's out of range of the KSC, he won't be able to edit or remove that maneuver node. So just make sure you plot it whilst you're still outside of the MUN sphere of influence to ensure that you have a direct connection to the Kerbal Space Center. Now that we've entered the MUN sphere of influence, we are technically in space high above the MUN, which means we can perform some science. We're going to run the Mystery Goo, Science Junior, Barometer and Thermometer. We unfortunately can't do a seismic scan just yet. We're also going to do a crew report and an EVA report. We do have to be outside the ship on EVA, funnily enough, to do an EVA report. So once you exit the capsule, do make sure you right click it and press take data so that you can perform more crew reports later on. And you can also take the data from the other experiments. Once you've taken the data from the Science Junior and Mystery goo right click those and hit restore you can't do that unless you've got a scientist kerbal but by doing the restore you can then run those experiments again and we will of course be running them again fairly soon but the first thing we should be thinking about doing is executing our maneuver node burn so same thing applies as before we're going to look at our burn time which is 22 seconds which means we're going to start burning about 11 seconds before we reach our maneuver node now circularizing at the MUN is nowhere near as treacherous as Midmus because the surface terrain itself does not vary quite as dramatically. But I'm going to aim for a periapsis and apoapsis height of around 20 kilometers just to ensure that we are definitely clear of all land hazards. And as you can see, I'm running the science experiments again here because we are now in space just above the surface of the MUN, which gives us fresh science to harvest. And then we can start thinking about actually landing. So we're going to open the map screen and just perform a small, very, very small retrograde burn just so we're on an impact course to the MUN. But you don't want to be going like straight down. So you don't want to kill off too much speed just so you're coming on a nice arcing descent. I'm now creating a maneuver node at our point of impact and dragging out the retrograde marker until the yellow dotted line is completely straight and vertical and having a look at the burn time, which is 32 seconds. 
uh, just over 500 meters per second. The point of this maneuver node was to show us how long it would take us to kill off all of our velocity, which is obviously what we want to do if we want to perform a safe landing that we can walk away from. Once we've made a mental note of how long this will be, we're going to create another maneuver node at our point of impact and just keep an eye on the node in T minus indicator. Obviously, we're not going to be executing any burns here because the maneuver node there is just there to tell us when our point of impact will be. So since my estimated burn time was 32 seconds, I'm going to start burning probably a little bit just before then, actually, about 35 seconds before our moment of impact, just so we can start killing off all of our velocity. We probably don't want to do it bang on the dot, just so you have a little bit of wiggle room to fine tune your landing, just if you need to make sure you're not going to land on a steep slope or anything like that. What I'm going to do is just make sure we're holding the retrograde marker at all times on the nav ball, making sure that the nav ball is relative to the surface. If yours says orbit or target for some reason, just right click on the green text at the top of the nav ball until it says surface. And then if you're playing on science mode like me, Bob should be able to just hold auto SAS by clicking on the retrograde marker on those little buttons to the left. Now that our speed is at a controllable pace, just below 100 meters per second, I'm actually going to cut the throttle at this point and just let us coast down a little bit close to the surface. I would probably recommend quick saving at this point because we're going to be using our eyeballs to do the last bit of our descent. So Bob can continue holding auto retrograde and just use shift and control to do some very light burning just to kill off all of our horizontal speeds so we can ensure that we're coming down straight vertically to make things as easy as possible. I pretty much got our speed down to about zero, about 200 meters above the surface itself. And now we're going to just continue holding retrograde relative to the surface, which hopefully is now straight in the middle of the nav ball and just using very, very light burns to get our descent nice and slow before ultimately touching down. The mud is not as forgiving as Minmus. You really don't want to be hitting the surface any faster than about five meters per second. I usually aim for about one meters per second for the mud, just in case. Now we've touched down on a fairly flat piece of terrain, so we don't have to worry about our lander tipping over. As you can see, we can't actually delete the maneuver node now because we are no longer in direct connection to the KSC. So you could do one or two things. You could time warp so that you're facing the Kerbal Space Center so that you can delete it that way. Or you can just quick save and quick load and then the maneuver node will be automatically removed. But congratulations, you have now done the hardest part of your MUN mission. We can pat ourselves on the back and get ready to perform some science experiments. So... Same as before, Mystery Goo, Science Junior, Thermometer, Barometer, Crew Report, EVA Report. But now we can also do a seismic scan as well because we are sitting on the surface of something. So don't forget to run that one. Then it's very important to get out and plant a flag, but also to gather a surface sample as well because you get a lot of science points from recovering surface samples. Now, I did say in the previous episode that in this series, we're only going to be going to one biome per planet or moon just to make the series a little bit more challenging for me and also to vary up our locations. So once we're back on the ship, we're just going to think about getting back home. Hopefully you have at least about 800 meters per second of delta V remaining so that we can easily get back to Kerbin. For our launch, we're going to aim along the 90 degree vector on the nav board and pretty much start flying flat immediately. You may want to go up a little bit higher at first if you are near any crater walls, but for me, I want a fairly flat piece of terrain so I can tip 45 degrees initially, but then very quickly start aiming completely horizontally. Once our apoapsis is about three minutes away, that'll be a nice safe distance for us to circularize without worrying about crashing into the surface again mid burn. So I'm just going to time warp up to our apoapsis. Now, in this case, I can't actually create a maneuver node because we're on the wrong side of the mun. So I'm just going to start a prograde burn about 10 seconds away from our apoapsis and we should be fine. So I'm just going to use auto SAS and look at that a fairly circular orbit. It doesn't really matter too much because we have plenty of delta V to play around with. It's not really a big of an issue. And then we can just time warp so that our ship is once again in view of Kerbin and has a direct connection to the Kerbal Space Center. All I'm doing here is dragging out the prograde marker until our periapsis pretty much reaches a point where it's inside Kerbin's atmosphere, making sure our predicted orbit line fires exactly backwards along the Mun's orbit around Kerbin. Now that that's done, we can just time warp over to our maneuver node and get ready to burn. It's a 12 second burn for me, so I'm going to start burning around six seconds before we reach the maneuver node itself. If you're struggling to get a periapsis that actually falls at a desirable height from here, don't worry, just aim for a periapsis that's fairly low around Kerbin, and then we could just perform a retrograde burn once we're outside of the Mun's sphere of influence. Just make sure you do that burn relatively high up around Kerbin just to save as much fuel as possible. Although that being said, fuel expenditure at this point is not really a concern because we're on a homeward bound trajectory. So heat shields in this game are pretty powerful, so it's not that important that our periapsis is fairly low. As long as you have a periapsis and it doesn't just disappear into the body of the planet, you shouldn't have any problems with overheating. 
Um, in fact, when you're in the vehicle assembly building, you could even shave off the ablator so you have less of it to save a little bit of weight so you have a bit more delta V, but you don't really need to because we have a lot of fuel on board this thing anyway. But as you can see, we only actually ended up burning off about 30 units of ablator, so we definitely could have saved a little bit of fuel by scraping some of that off in the vehicle assembly building but like i say ultimately it doesn't save us that much fuel given that we had a little bit more than we really needed to begin with and there is our splash down there so i guess there's nothing further to do other than to recover our vessel and take a look at the signs that we've unlocked but look at that we managed to earn a whopping 842 units of science on this mission so we can go ahead and open the r d building and see what we can buy First of all, I'm going to unlock some bigger rocket parts just so we can go a bit deeper into space outside of the Kerbin system. So I'm going to unlock two of the nodes from the rocketry tab, as well as the advanced fuel systems and importantly the nuclear engine as well, so we can make really efficient ships. It'll also be worthwhile unlocking the aviation tab here just so we can get the Mark 1 liquid fuselage, which is really, really good for nuclear engines. And then I'm finally going to spend the last of our science points on some better landing gear just so we can have something a little bit more durable than those diddly little landing legs we used in this episode and the previous one and that pretty much wraps us up for this episode i hope you enjoyed it next time we'll definitely go into planetary so on the screen there's some links on the left is a link to the full playlist of this series and on the right was chosen for you by youtube's recommendation algorithm there's also a link to subscribe as well as check out the patreons if you want to and in the description you'll find links to my discord twitter instagram and merchandise store guys i hope you enjoyed this video very much and i hope you enjoy the rest of your week